I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater week by week and show by show. And Andrew, don't you love living in the modern world of 1989? I love the modern world of 1989. That's why I am in a basement looking for a rare piece of music so that I can try out for a really cool uh, opera show that I'm going to star in in the present year of 1989. Yes. Oh my gosh. Look at this. It's an opera um, written by a man who might have murdered a singer. Wow, that sounds right up my alley, Jess. <laughs> I'm going to walk <laughs> away for a second and oh my gosh, is that blood coming out of the music? Wow, it really looked like it for a moment, but it's gone now, so I guess it's totally fine for me to now go and sing this piece. Oh, go sing it. Uh, go there. Oh no, wow, Andrew! Wow, 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 Look wow, at that! Wow. It's a thingy! It's gonna smack you in the face all the way back to the 1800s and in London. Oh my god, I got transported to a different continent and year. <laughs> because I sang the wrong piece of music. <laughs> Bro, what the fuck is this? Like, what? What? It, why? In case you haven't picked up what we're throwing down, we're continuing our Phantom May. It's Phantom of the Opera May. Ooh, the Phantom of the Opera closed, and now we're talking about Phantom of the Opera throughout May. But everything except for the stage show, Phantom of the Opera. And this week, we are talking about one of the wildest adaptations, but also strangely one of the best adaptations of the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> it's, it is weird that it's both, but I, yeah. I also agree. <laughs> it has so much good in it and then also some of the most baffling choices i had ever seen <laughs> this week we are talking about the phantom of the opera 1989 cue the music of the opera it was written by jerry o'hara and duke sandifer with music by misha siegel um directed by dwight h little based on gaston larue's phantom of the opera kind of i i mean you could you could say that um, it's at least inspired by it has a deep inspiration by it um it has uh, <laughs> let's i wouldn't call it in name only but it's getting there but the film premiered theatrically on November 3rd, 1989 in 1,468 venues, ranking 6th at the domestic box office with $2 million in its first weekend. The film closed three weeks later, having grossed $3.9 million. The plot of The Phantom of the Opera is when Christine Day, not Daye, D-A-Y, discovers a rare piece of music, she brings back to life its composer, Eric Dessler. Through her fascination with the music, she is transported back to Dessler's time, 1889, and is thrust into stardom by singing his opera as no one else can. But against the exciting backdrop of the opera lurks a hideous danger, the Phantom. And Christine soon finds herself the object of his relentless desire. I like how that plot is so contrived that they list the Phantom and Eric Dessler as two different individuals. Yes. When not even the movie is trying to posit that a little bit. Well, I mean, the original source material, maybe. Maybe. No, it has no. has a mystery. It has a mystery, but that is not the mystery. <laughs> no, the, yeah. Well, her name's Christine Day because she's American in this one. Yeah, she's American, not Swedish. Um, people... Nor is it French. It doesn't take place in the Opera Garnier. 
takes place in just British opera. We did do a commentary on this a few years ago on our Patreon, which I still think is a lot of fun if you go and listen to it. But I, I don't know. I keep coming back to this one. And I, we weren't originally going to talk about it, but then I made the jump decision that we had to. We had to talk about this one because it's probably one of the better adaptations of the story, despite having literal time travel, brothels, and, you know, blood orgasms. There is so much weirdness, Mm -hmm. but it's just too fun, too much fun to watch to not talk about. And it's a brisk, like, 90 minutes, 93 minutes. (laughs) I think one thing to say about this is if you are someone who really likes like the the Weber Phantom, this is probably not for you. Honestly, I disagree. I think this is probably the most for you outside really? of that. I think this is a good okay. like gateway from that. Okay, well, what's your reasoning? Because my reasoning is that the Phantom is the least sexy in this that he has ever been, probably. Yeah, but he's also <laughs> somehow the like most emotionally like open in this like the scene where he's watching christine like perform and he's like a little kid excited like that feels very much like the teddy bear version of the phantom in weber like there's a good mix of both and i think that this rides that line there is the fact though that this is also just a a gruesome slasher movie oh very much so he is the reason he's so unsexy is because he is he just loves murder like Yes. Loves murder. It's his favorite thing in the whole world. Yes. Let's have that drink. <laughs> Literally, in the first murder, he looks like he is having an emission of some kind. And he gets splattered with blood on his face in the mix of it. It's... He just, he loves murder. And not only does he not love murder, he loves skinning his victims and wearing it. That is the the most, I think that might be the most biggest departure outside of the time travels. Instead of like a normal mask, like a cloth mask or whatever, he wears a human flesh mask over his face to make him look normal. Honestly, is kind of a cool idea. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, if, if you're like, how do we make the Phantom into like more of a horror monster? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good step. <laughs> It's an interesting take, but it it feels like it was done for a marketing reason just to promote uh, Robert Englund because he looks like Freddy. And often the makeup does look Freddy-esque, but I don't think it's ever like a one-to-one on as Freddy. There's definitely a lot of overlap. I mean, the makeup underneath like his face is very Freddy-esque. They're definitely trying to cash in. I mean, there's no doubt. They're trying to cash in on a Nightmare on Elm Street's like, popularity in Robert England. This is 1989, so this is, what, when Nightmare on Elm Street like 4 or 5 would have been coming out? Yes, and the director, is, this is, his follow-up is to Halloween 4, uh, The Return of Michael Myers. So he does that, and then he does this. <laughs> Halloween 4. The return of Michael Myers. Maybe nobody knows how to stop him. I mean, this is probably better than Halloween 4. (laughs) I don't know. Halloween 4 isn't bad. Um, Halloween 4 has vibes. Okay. I like Halloween 1 and 3. I don't remember 2 very well, but I think that one's okay. Halloween 2 is just kind of... Like, Halloween 2 is just like, Halloween again! And Halloween yeah. 4 is Halloween again, but with vibes. Is Halloween 4 the one where he's a, it's a, a cult? No, that's Halloween 6. Okay, so I'm thinking of 6. Do I know I... too much about the Halloween franchise? Probably. There is a lot of movies there. <laughs> Halloween, <laughs> sorry, Phantom of the Opera 1989, though. It's a beautiful looking movie. It looks creepier than probably any other phantom adaptation that i had have seen uh we got a couple there's one that might look a little creepier well that i've seen i haven't seen some of them (laughs) as of right now um but i really like the they go down into this like disgusting dungeon that he has and it's all these like candles um it's like it's unrealistic, like, but it looks really cool. They they're not they're willing to to bend 
the rules of reality a little bit to make things look cooler in this movie. But it's also, you don't feel the budget. Like, this is obviously not, doesn't have the biggest budget in the world. It was originally going to be a canon film. Something called, some unknown company, I think it's like Orion, like, knockoff. Um, I, what is it, 21st Century or something like that? It's like 20th Century Fox, but not quite. Um, <laughs> produced it. 21st Century Film Corporation, you know. Maybe if somebody read it really fast, they would be like, oh, 20th Century Fox You know, on a this. sheet of paper, they'd be like, 21st Century Fox? Oh, that's a big deal. <laughs> you know we got we gotta lock that in oh my goodness the scam the scams <laughs> i really feel like this film didn't have to go as hard as it did but the biggest thing that really draws you in is robert england's performance you love the music Our souls are one. No! No! Now, you are married to the music. You cannot serve two masters. He isn't playing Freddy. I'll say that. Like, the makeup team probably wanted him to look a bit like Freddy. The director probably was like, come on, dude, be Freddy. But he didn't, he doesn't play Freddy. He's trying to be a bit more sympathetic than, like, Freddy could really ever be. And I think he actually does a really good job of making the Phantom a different character. And uh, strangely sympathetic. Like, like, he's still very much Mr. Murder Man. When we did the commentary on this, I think I had a lot of praise for the portrayal of the Phantom because I, I had, we had done Phantom of the Opera and Love Never Dies. And I was like, I don't like these overly sympathetic portrayals of the Phantom where he's like a lover boy. I don't, I don't enjoy that. I want him to be Murder Man. You really like wor- Murder Man. <laughs> yeah, and then we watch this, and it's like, holy shit, he's Murder Man. <laughs> Everyone dies. I only choose the time and place for a few. Murder Man is his main goal, and most, they are often afraid to make a Murder Man. Uh, I, I'm not here. <laughs> I mean, um, maybe that's a little dumb considering what we are covering at the moment, which is mostly like, you know, um, Phantom of the Mall. Honestly, Phantom of the Mall, though, is not nearly as good as this. And they came out the same year, so. Yeah, you're right. So out of which horror Phantom of the Opera version with, with Strange Music, I think this is the better one. Something I really like is even though he's horrible murder man, they still make him like obsessively in love with Christine. They they go like one step farther than usual with that. Whereas usually he's obsessively in love with Christine and that's kind of it. But here he's obsessively in love with her and he follows her through time, like a hundred years into the future and finds her again because he is forever as long as his music exists or some ridiculous nonsense like that. And they will always find each other. We had a bargain, remember? Forever. It's it's really weird. Can we can we talk about the time travel thing? Well, do, do we have, have to? to like like what what is there to say? Well, why do you think they did it? I know why they did it. <laughs> um, you know why they did it. Okay. I do. So this was written, planned to be not one film but two, and England was under contract to appear in a sequel. Uh, but it was canceled after the film's poor reception. And for it's been under numerous rumors, but the idea was that the second one would be all in the 1980s or modern day. Okay, so there was going to be a sequel that only... See, honestly, that's a cool idea. Yes. <laughs> because, namely because from what they show of the future version of the Phantom, he's actually really cool. It's so cool. And they actually gave <laughs> us a proper unmasking. Yeah, and... And um, she sees him and, and she's like, oh, well, that's that looks like the guy. And he she I think she assumes she was dreaming the whole time travel thing. Um, But so she like goes home with him. But he has modern anti-aging stuff and whatever. Like to proper keep his face. faces like it's so yeah. cool looking. And the pitch was that he was going to be living in the subway systems and fall in love with a blind woman. Interesting. I, I feel like I would have just stuck with what they had, honestly. I love his, he has like a studio where he, he has the, the keyboard and he has the music written out as a MIDI file. Like, that would have been really <laughs> cool. 
I agree. And honestly, that's when the film, because the film loses you and g- grabs you back a few times. England confirmed that in, t- in a 2004 interview that a script had been written. And while he personally felt it was superior to the first film, it had never been filmed in a capacity. And he <laughs> basically was like, I wanted to make that one. That was the one. What was left of the script became 1992's uh, Dance Macabre, which I have not seen, and no one else has apparently either. Someone loves to dance macabre. Who is willing to pay the price? Uh, Not much connective tissue can be found aside from Robert England. When asked in 2012 whether a sequel could ever happen, he said it would be overwhelming to see a sequel, and the chances of it happening are highly unlikely. Basically, no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I would I almost find that interesting. He's not a bad choice for the Phantom. He wouldn't be my first choice, but he's actually, if I were to rank my Phantoms, he would definitely be somewhere in the top five to three category. He, he really does a pretty good job. I think the only thing we don't really get from him is I don't think he sings. No, but he does instruct like this. That's he what does. sets him apart from a lot of other ones. Is no, that never- actually makes sense. Because, I mean, the reason that he needs Christine is that she is his voice, right? I like it's, that. It's like Phantom of the, the Paradise, where the Phantom <laughs> can't sing. Uh, yeah, where he can't sing and, and he has to get someone else to sing for him. Yeah, I, I like that aspect to him. And I like that it's not, he just likes her to like her. It's not because she looks like his mother or that there's like some divine intervention. It's just like, oh, I like her because I like her. Another... He likes her because she's real. And that's why he hates Carlotta. <laughs> that's why he has to behead Carlotta and put it in the soup. <laughs> she wasn't There's real the, enough um, for him. What is the, the plot line with the guy who like is just so frustrated with Carlotta? He's like so mad at her. Is he he's like one of the owners of the, yes. the opera house? I love that. <laughs> it's I such love a... that. There's so many little fun things going on in this movie that his reaction, she she's like, Carlotta's like, I can't go on. And he's so mad about it. But it's like perfectly reasonable because she finds a, 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 skinned a man body. skinned alive in her closet. This is one of the more reasonable Carlottas. <laughs> it's like, of course, she doesn't want to go on. I mean, Jesus, I Christ. Wouldn't. <laughs> you're lucky she's ever going to come back. <laughs> I agree i think that all right i'm gonna be a little mean jill sholin as christine not that great (laughs) oh my god chris chris are you okay not that great in what way i don't know she just feels like zoe deschanel put in a period piece i i i think that yeah she feels too modern and i think it's they should have gotten an actress that wasn't american to perform but they did this whole thing and they justify it, sort of. They made they made a choice and they stuck with it and god damn it, whatever. The thing is, the budget that they're on, are they gonna find the perfect actress to perform this role? I don't you know? know. They found Molly Shannon <laughs> for the the Manhattan segments before she was anyone. <laughs> okay. Like that that's a weird thing that I keep forgetting every time I turn this movie on is that Molly Shannon is like we're in a Molly Shannon sandwich that starts and ends with her. <laughs> like, oh, it's you. I keep forgetting. It's nice to see you. Also, I do want to say something I always make sure to stay through the credits to see. Um, there's a disclaimer at the end of the film that says this motion picture is not associated with any current or prior stage play or motion picture of the same name. You know, just to make sure ALW doesn't doesn't (laughs) come and start hurting them. I really like this movie. I really, really do. Did other people like this movie when it came out? I guess it's time to find that out. It's time for our favorite segment of the show where we compare our opinions to those of the real theater critics over there on Letterboxd.com. It's time for previews. It's time for previews. It's time for previews. All right, Andrew. This is the letterbox game where it's one star or five star, and you have to tell me which one it is based on the review alone. Are you ready? Uh, As ready as I can be. All right. (laughs) There's some chaotic ones here. (laughs) I forgot. This is such a like niche movie. I'm I'm guessing there's some weirdos in the in the letterbox. (laughs) All right. First one. 
Christine and Meg were lovers. Five stars. I, and I, I kind of agree. I tend to agree. I, I agree, and that is correct. Next one. Will Robert England, no D, ever get to play a non-deformed, non-murderous person? No? Oh, okay then. You know, I think Robert England chooses his roles and kind of enjoys playing this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, there's a reason he kept playing Freddy for, for like a decade. <laughs> He's just that good at it. He didn't have to. He, he If he didn't want to, he was pretty famous at that point, I bet. He probably could have gotten some other fucking role. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, this is a one star because they're angry that their their best boy is getting bad roles. You are correct. And he really doesn't <laughs> get the best roles. Oh, he is a good actor. Like he is a there's a reason why he stuck around as Freddy for so long. Didn't he show up in uh, Stranger Things or something? I I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, but. but who didn't show up in Stranger Things if they were around in the 80s? That's true. That's true. All right. Next one. The Applebee's in Mechanicsville has great service. Drinks were great and arrived in these cool chalices. And the food was great. Overall, enjoyable experience. Now that's eating good in the neighborhood. The what now? Uh, the app. <laughs> Is this a reference to the movie that I'm missing? I have no idea. It was just in the review. <laughs> and I was like, how can I not include that? This is in the reviews for the Look 1989 up, Phantom of the Opera. It is. The Applebee's and Mechanic. So are they reviewing the movie or are they reviewing the Applebee's? They that said is... the Applebee's is great. So <laughs> five, five stars for an excellent Applebee's experience. That was a one star for an excellent <laughs> Applebee's experience. I don't understand it either, kids. What in the fuck? <laughs> Next up, why the fuck is it in London? I mean, I would say it's because the original book is in London, but I don't actually know if that's the case. France. Yeah, so I have no fucking clue why it's in London. <laughs> uh, is it because uh, in music theater, if, if something is French, we make it British? <laughs> well, if how lame is everyone has British accents? <laughs> Vive um, la France! Okay, one star. They're mad. That is correct. I, are you gonna? Are you? No, you're not falling for a perfect game because you got the Applebee's and Mechanicsville. I got the Applebee's one wrong. There's a Mechanicsville near me, but they don't have an Applebee's. I don't think. Have you checked? <laughs> I should check. Maybe this is a another upstate New Yorker. Next up, so Phantom Core. Um, tr- true. I mean, Phantom Core. It, it's a literally a Phantom movie. So, I, I, is it even Phantom Core? Okay, five. Is that stars. like an Apple Core? Um, that is correct. It is at five stars. Um, next up, and only two more. Don't worry. <clears throat> Damn, those scars are nasty. But I smash a psycho bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what in the fuck? <laughs> Uh, this is one of the only Phantom of the Opera adaptations where he does get laid he goes to prostitutes and he, he treats does. them respectfully and just pays them and there's no violence towards them and you know what good on this movie sex worker is real work it actually is weird he, 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 you, you would expect him to kill them but no yeah, he, he kills actually other people at the brothel he does, he does do the weird thing where he's like insists to call them Christine but I mean I guess he is paying them so <laughs> and he paid them well like in gold coins yeah and he doesn't kill them afterwards which he, you know he wanted I mean to. bare minimum <laughs> the only thing he loves more than Christine is murder yeah five stars for this one <laughs> that's a one star fuck um, me <laughs> last one I always said you can't do Phantom of the Opera without time travel it's so true Honestly, every other fandom version, once you watch this one, it's going to be like, where's the time travel plot? F- five stars for the time travel plot. <laughs> that is a one star. And that uh, wraps up our letterbox game. I did my best. Can you imagine another like classic literary novel being adapted this wantonly? I'm sure like Romeo and Juliet, it's been done. I guess, but I wouldn't call like within the last 200 years. Romeo and Juliet's like 600 years old. Maybe That's I'm true. exaggerating. Maybe. Like, what would be, like, an Agatha Christie, but also in space? I want to say it's probably been done, but I'm trying to think of an example, and I don't know if I can. I know they did a <laughs> Doctor Who episode of Agatha Christie where there was bumblebees flying all around. Okay. Space bumblebees, sorry. I, I didn't want to get the vernacular wrong. There were space bumblebees, because Doctor, True is, uh, Doctor Who is a very important show for very important people. Doctor Who, from the writers of Space Cop. 
<laughs> How about we go into a mid show? <laughs> Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a show at you. I joined this for a dollar. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Andrew, what is Patreon? Man, Patreon is where you can go if you want to give us a little bit of money to support the show. Money, us money, money. You also get some stuff for yourself as well, since we have a lot of commentary tracks, extra podcast episodes... Just all sorts of shit up on there. You can request episodes from us when we're not doing Phantom May. Phantom May. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera in May. <laughs> Just all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and also, it's going to heat up a lot more in June. Sincerely, right now, I, Jesse's in the middle of a bit of a thing that is taking up an inordinate amount of his time, and he's apologizing for the lack of content up there to our dearly loving patrons. But Just- more is coming. Are you trying to say that Phantom May is actually a ploy so that you don't have to do as much work on musicals with cheese? It is almost 100% that. I don't yes. have to watch new things. I yes. already know how I feel about these guys. <laughs> Making a oh. movie might be the thing that kills me, and God forbid if I want to make my little podcast a little easier. All right. Uh, our current I patrons, to? Uh, uh, our, our current patrons are Melissa Goldman, Danielle Rennox, Jess the Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Nathaniel, Stacy Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Mary Lou, Chell, Cat, John Finale, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Gracie, Kyle Summers, Jen A C, Scoot in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Liz Lem, Nothing is certain except Beth and Taxes, Desby and Raphael Martinez, Salas, Jessica T and Mitchell Young, Chai T Cop. Katie McDonough, Chris Marco, TG, Marie Anastasio, Layla, RJ, Norija, Holly Butcher, Bjorn Hermans, Toriana Frazier, Sammy Most Lopez, Liana Morton, Kaylee Blazier, Cinema Get in Reviews and Villainous Miss, Sofiana Ali, The Omega Geek, Paige Pearson, Mar- Maddie Wargo, Lisa Erdman, Lana Luskatova, Sarah Den, Black, your Evan Ball, Zachary Torres, Rora Morasso, Mara Forloin. Captain Rotastic, Lisa L, Nobody, Renee Thomas, What Did Boris Say, Puffy Boy, Summer, Julia Hardy, and Jay Kusia. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you would like to join them in supporting us and get all the fun perks over there, they're going to heat up in June, I promise. We're going to start meeting up again. The Discord is popping. Come join us over at Patreon. <laughs> all right, let's get back to it. So we did talk about how this takes a lot of departures away from what is usually in a Phantom of the Opera adaptation. We, in previous episodes, talked about, we we did LaRue comparisons, and we had like a little checklist of what we think are things that are essential to the Phantom of the Opera story, including things like a chandelier crash, the Punjab lasso, um, Carlotta, and things like that. So we do have Carlotta. We are actually in an opera house, which... So far in Phantom May, we have not been, I am discovering. Well, now we are. Well, I mean, Phantom of the Paradise, it's not an opera house, but it is a music venue. venue. It's close enough, I would say. Arguably close enough. Yes, yes, yes. Um, The Phantom does commit murders. I don't think he did any with a noose. Um, I'm going to argue one. The very very first one we see. It's a rope, but he doesn't like. Roped, tied around his leg kind of thing. Yeah, but he just embowels him. (laughs) So, so, so far, Phantom of the Mall has been more accurate. So far, but this front, has... On that front. This has <laughs> one aspect that is in very few adaptations, and that is Christine at the, her father's grave, which is one of the most interesting scenes in the book because he just starts throwing skulls and stuff. Um, it's, a weird, it's a weird scene in the book. And here, he just kidnaps her, which makes sense. Why, like, like, why is it always in her dressing room and not here? This is a much more interesting place to kidnap someone. There's also the really cool thing with that where he plays the violin. What do I do now? Father? Yeah, he plays the violin in the in the original book too. 
Yeah, so like there I don't know, there is there is some actual LaRue inspired. And I think this is the only version of this story that starts with the title Gaston LaRue's Phantom of the Opera. I think that's only because they don't want they don't want to confuse it with the uh... Lloyd Webber's, but they also yeah. do want to. They they didn't want to false advertise it as being a part of Lloyd Webber, but they did want to false advertise it to being connected to Freddy Krueger somehow. Yes, they did want to do that. We do have a lot of murder, which is not like it. We have a Raul equivalent. I think his name's like Philippe or something. No, isn't his name Richard? You no, know, Richard. Yes, I'm thinking of another one. They Americanize the main characters' names for whatever reason. Yeah, except Carlotta. <laughs> Yeah, except Carlotta. But I guess that's because there's a, a long tradition in American cinema of Europeans being uh, the bad guys. <laughs> I guess. Do you know who this doctor, uh, this guy who plays Richard is? Uh, no, who is it? His name is Alex Hyde White, and he played Reed Richards in the Roger Corman version of the Fantastic Four. <laughs> really? That is, that is a credit. That is a credit. I think it's, and also Bill Nighy from many of things, including the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, is literally just Martin Barton, who, Martin Barton, god damn it. Uh, <laughs> I think Martin he's like, Barton. He's the detective that's like on the hunt. Is the detective uh, part of the original nope. book? I guess the closest thing you would have is the Persian, the Daroga, who's like kind of helping out the Phantom. Um, they do have the mirror in this, like the actual trick mirror. Um, she doesn't kidnap her through the mirror, but it is there. He also has like a bunch of tunnels because like how else is he getting like these bodies to these weird locations? Like I, he must have other ways. There's the tunnels, but he also has, th there is something magical about him because he does like Batman teleport when fighting the broods in the, in the city. That's true. He, well, I mean, it, okay, we didn't get into it totally, but he made a literal deal with the devil. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, uh, a, a small person is the devil, and while watching Faust, he flashes back to making that deal, and it, he's just a normal guy. Like, there isn't, like, a birth deformity like it usually is, or, like, a, like acid being spilt on him or fire. Um, he... <laughs> is cursed with ugliness. Kind of like Phantom of the Paradise. He made a contract with the devil that people would love him for his music, but that's all they would ever love him for. Honestly, yeah, this this has a lot of different connections to Phantom of the Paradise now that I'm thinking about it, too, because mm -hmm. they're doing, and maybe they are in the original book, but they're performing Faust? Yes, and they um, often perform Faust in uh, Phantom of the Opera adaptations. Yeah, but... Then there's also the actual story connection to it as well with him selling his soul to the devil. So there's some there's some stuff with that. But then, much like Phantom of the Paradise, his soul is directly connected with people knowing his music, which is why when Christine pulls his music out again, he's suddenly born again. Yeah, if that's how you want to interpret that. How do you interpret it? <laughs> I guess I interpret it as like the music, like that the music itself is what keeps him alive, and he didn't return necessarily he's just always been around trying to find her gotcha then why like the reason why i was thinking that is because of the bloody music and like all that when she finds it yeah i don't i don't know how dare we unpack this film that was thrown together <laughs> very blatantly <laughs> <laughs> all right there's, look at there's, us treating it like it's an actual movie there's another section there's another thing we need to talk about and that's the kills Yes. There's a lot of kills in this. Yes, you have. Actually, what is your favorite kill in this movie? Oh, man. Jeez. The thing is, the kills themselves aren't that creative or great. Like, there's elements I like of a lot of them. Like, I really like the fact that he skinned the person alive and shoved them in, in Carlotta's uh, closet, I guess. I don't even know what that was. Wardrobe? Yeah, like a little wardrobe, and she's in the bath. Yeah, I really like that. Like, that's a very sight. I mean, that's another connection to Phantom of the Paradise, the Phantom torturing Colt Carlotta in the shower and or bath. I like, I like Carlotta's death, elements of it. I don't love the execution. I don't like the, like, entire head getting pulled out of the soup. That's a little silly. That's kind of what I loved. I think it was so silly. That's what I loved about it. It was so stupid. Maybe it's just too, it doesn't look good enough. Like, I wanted it to look a little better. Mm-hmm. Like, but I don't know. Maybe if they found like part of her like head or something, I don't even know. 
Or if it was like a shot of it floating in the soup instead of them pulling it out. That yeah. would have been interesting. Uh. Um, <laughs> but speaking of that, um, this also includes the Eric and the Red Death, which is very rarely included in adaptations outside of like the original 20s film as well as the musical. And his costume looks incredible. The, it looks wonderful. What will I think when I see you? You'll just die. Yeah, his him actually showing up in that costume, he looks very good. And the weird guy that's like, who is that? I must know. I love the rat catcher. Who I'm is the rat dressed catcher. As... That's also that's also from the book. There's so, there's so many good things in this. I mean, yeah, it is strangely one of the more accurate versions of it. I mean, what, sh- what other kills? Because I'm missing a bunch. Like, there's a whole fuck ton of kills. I think one of my favorites is when he cuts off a dude's head and rolls it towards his friend. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that on the street or was that in... That was on the street. And then he yeah, also the kills the guy in the bath. But honestly, my favorite has to be when he kills Richard <laughs> by stabbing him and setting him on fire. It's so bizarre. He, he he has, like, a bunch of candles, and it's like he accidentally lights him on fire by, like, mm-hmm. like wrestling with him, but then he pulls out one of the things, one of the candle things that is, like, holding a candle, and it's, like, a knife for some reason, and he <laughs> stabs him with it. <laughs> it's so weird. It is, but <laughs> name another Phantom adaptation that has the balls to kill Raul. <laughs> Imagine if that's how fucking... Love the- dies. Well, he doesn't die. Yeah. He just yeah, that's true. gets nerfed. You know they wanted to kill him, though. It would have been better if he died, honestly. N- the weirdest... <laughs> 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 so, Love Never Dies is actually based on a book called The Phantom of Manhattan. <laughs> and this is ridiculous. Uh, can we just write... Can we write our own story, Phantom of, and then just insert something? We literally can. There's, like, the Disney Channel Phantom of the Megaplex. There's a ton of those. Um, Phantom of the Muppet Theater? You know what? I'm into it. <laughs> Get Jared <laughs> Butler back. Um... But in the Phantom Manhattan, you, it's Andrew Lloyd Webber commissioned that book by Frederick Forsyth. And the way that they make sure that you know that the Phantom is the father of this child, who I think has a different name in the book, is because Raoul got into a duel and the guy shot his testicles off. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he can't possibly have kids. Yes. <laughs> And you know what? Andrew Lloyd Webber made some choices in that adaptation, decided, you know what? I'm not going to keep that one. Raul's like, wait, this child can't be mine. I lost my balls in a horrific accident. In a horrific <laughs> dueling accident. I went too far with CBT. It's over for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, what do you, I think my favorite part of this is honestly the final scene with, um, not the final final scene, but like when she's back and she goes to his apartment and then she turns on the music and then she just tears his face off. That is so good. Yeah. That is like, this movie has faults, but like almost the time travel thing was worth it for that moment. I feel like the time travel thing at the beginning, you're like, what the fuck? Like, why are they doing this? But then at the end, you're like, oh, nice. Like, and the they're final tearing his shots- face off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little ridiculous but and his the way he looks robert england's look at the end of this movie as like modern phantom looks like the yuppiest kind of douchebag that you'd find in like the theater scene who are you a very relieved admirer i thought we lost the star of our show there for a minute now this is mr foster mr a uh, producer and major backer <laughs> Well, I guess that makes me an authority on how you'll be spending your time for a while. Robert England, I think he plays two types of characters, and it's um, it's Freddy Krueger, obviously, and not Freddy and Krueger, then, and then like he's like usually this yuppie type guy. Yes, I'm thinking of um of him playing himself in uh Nightmare on Elm in, Street, in new, new Nightmare, in new Nightmare, uh, and like that's his other character when he plays himself. <laughs> but like he auditioned for Luke Skywalker, like that was his type for years. Imagine if he played both those roles, if he was Freddy and Luke Skywalker. I mean, Mark Hamill has been like serial killers. I mean, he's been the Joker, obviously, but like other things, like Brigsby Bear and shit like that. Like, yeah, but Mark how Hamill's iconic also... would it have been to be Freddy Krueger and Luke Skywalker? 
would he still be Freddy Krueger if he was Luke Skywalker? Would he be typecast? I feel like he wouldn't have gotten that role. Well, they probably wouldn't have been able to afford him on the original uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. He was kind of a name. Like, he he has, like, the Shakespeare credits. He was on V, which was a very popular show at the time. Um, so he had something to his name. Um, he does get to show his more, like, theatrical performance side in this. Oh, we should just talk about the one song, though. The Don Juan Triumphant song by Misha Singal. Yeah, because basically there's two songs in this. There's the Faust song, which I'm pretty mm. sure is not written for this movie. Yes, that is used in a lot of things. Da, 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 da. You know that one. Yeah, so it's that. They do that. A lot. And then there's the other song, Don Juan, Don Juan Triumphant. Which and is that song supposedly <laughs> It's written by, by uh, Eric Dessler, the allegedly. Allegedly, although we, I mean, I think we actually know who wrote it. I don't, I don't know his name. Misha Singal. Singal. Um, but goddamn, it's a fucking banger. He fucking knocked it out of the park. They play it throughout the whole thing. It um, never gets old. It really doesn't. And it's so short, but it's just like, goddamn. <laughs> and the best one is the one they build to in the credits. <laughs> like that best, that's sweet. Like they play it like a little bit, like he plays it on the violin a lot. He plays it. She sings it on, like, the piano. Every time, there's a different variation. It's never just the same version, so it never gets old. Now, there is a time paradox, of Oh, course, there is. Be- because of this song. Yeah. Um, she learns the words from his sheet music in the future. Yes. Uh, and then she travels back in time and remembers the words. And when she first sings along to his song, the Phantom implies that he didn't have words for it he was like how did you know i haven't written words for it yet so are you suggesting she literally went back in time i think that's what the movie is i think she literally went back in time remembers the words from when she was in the future and then gives him the lyrics for the song and then he writes them down in the past and she finds them in the future which is how she knows them when she goes to the past. So there is a time paradox where how does she know the lyrics if he didn't write them, but she gave them to him because she already knew them. But because also, he wrote them. present day Christine says she recognizes this. It sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much going on with the fucking time travel thing. We can't. <laughs> Because I see your time travel paradox, but she also knows it in the present at the beginning. I don't fucking know. (laughs) I know this. I've heard it before. Oh, man. It's a wild choice that does not pay off even a little bit. Well, no, Um, it does. It It does. does. But as far as a narrative goes, uh, what? Who thought of this? Whose idea was that? On that note, Andrew. Why don't we rank these among the other Phantom of the Opera adaptations we have watched for Phantom Month and others? We already have it ranked. I forgot. We already ranked it. Let's just remind people of your ranking. You have number one, Phantom the American Musical. Um, number two, Phantom of the Paradise. Then the Andrew Lloyd Webber Phantom of the Opera. Then you have this. Are you going to... I, I think you got to move it. I got to move it up. Really? I think this is better than the Webber one. I think I just enjoy this more. It's short. It's sweet. It's goofy. It's stupid. I love it. It's really just more up my alley, like as far as like what I'm looking for in a movie or in a in a show. It's just it's piece of entertainment. Yeah. Not that the Weber one isn't entertaining. It it is. But there's long bats of not much happening in the Weber musical. 
Yeah, that's that's the issue I have with it more is like the Weber one. There's there's like big moments where you're like, oh fuck yeah, and then there's a lot of just like, well, when do we do the next thing? Whereas with this one, he's either doing some weird Christine shit, they're singing a badass song, or he's just murdering people just for fun. You know, like there's always something happening. As far as like stage or like time on screen, this one probably has more than most. He is a presence throughout unlike other ones that try to build him up. I think it's because they knew Robert England was a star and they wanted to focus on him, but I think overall it actually improves the experience of the movie a lot. I, I think so too. I don't think it was an intentional choice based on like narrative, I, it was, but it works and we're happy about it. It's this really what it feels like is um this is a lot of horrible corporate decisions to try to cash in on a bunch of trends. Accidentally making art. <laughs> just accidentally made something fun like it's just that's just how this ended up working out <laughs> i will say that um i don't know if you've watched the the um shutter series in search of darkness i have not um it's like three part documentary about 80s horror and each one is like four hours long they do do a segment on this they cover oh, almost really? every 80s horror film ever made and they do do a segment on this, and Robert England did talk about it. And he's like, "Yeah, I like it. It's fun. It's something different." Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fun. I think it's a fun thing to watch. And I don't know if this has been like forgotten necessarily, but I, I'm. It's tough for me to judge because I've known about it for a while now. I feel like the fandom with the PH, I mean, really has connected with it. But outside of that, it's it's a little bit forgotten. I feel like this is a this is a movie that has a lot of cult potential. Not as much as, say, Phantom of the Paradise. But... No, but I can imagine people watching this like horror fans, but also I think it's a nice horror gateway because it's not disgusting and you kind of know what's coming if you've seen Phantom of the Opera. So if you like the Phantom of the Opera musical and you're like, what would be a fun like little gateway into a horror slasher film? I honestly think this isn't a bad one. I think if you really like Phantom, this is a, a fun watch. Uh, and if you like Phantom and you like horror and you've ever thought, dang, what if Phantom was just a little bit scarier? That's fair enough. But what is your overall? I mean, we gave our overall thoughts, but what is your cheese rating, Andrew? I feel like you have to give it like a, a cheese pizza for the pizza face, you know, like the, <laughs> the Freddy Krueger pizza face. <laughs> we all love a good Freddy Krueger pizza face. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a tacky thing to give it, but I think cheese pizza is what I'm going to give it. Bon appetit! All right, and I am going to give this. I don't want to give it cheese pizza. I mean, the pepper. You were giving it a cheese pizza just because cheese. Um, I'm gonna give this frame flame boiled, like you know, like you know the cheese that you get that they like actually bo burn on a plate until it's crunchy, like the Greek oh, like, cheese. Yeah, yeah, You're that one. That? Yeah, I don't know what that's called. <laughs> um, yeah, what the fuck is that called? I don't actually know. I know what you're talking about, though. Saganaki. Ah, okay. Flaming Saganaki. Um, yeah, um, Saganaki Flaming Greek Cheese. Obviously, we have more to say on our Patreon, because you can check out our commentary on this thing and watch it along with us. Um, yeah, I think it's great. Come join us through our original adventure, where Andrew got to see the bloodgasm for the first time, and we had to unpack all the emotional trauma of this horror. And you can have an excuse to watch the movie. Yeah. And also, like, technically, I, I gave people the movie on Patreon. It's not the easiest thing to find. Uh, so I just uh, gave it to them. <laughs> Stealing is cool. But you know what else is cool? Our patrons. Thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Ad, Musicals with Cheese. We're on Patreon at Cheesy Musicals. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. We're on everything at Musicals with Cheese. Just fucking look at us. Look us up. We're gonna be good. Email <laughs> us at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. Um, here is some ASMR, but I'm gonna do it with a line from this movie. Everyone dies. I just choose the time and place for a few. Yeah, that was my best Robert England impression. Oh fuck. We didn't we didn't mention I wanted to talk about for one second where he almost says love never dies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me say this, then we can talk about it. Um thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform and for not kicking us off for talking about the dreaded CBT. Uh, VPN and CBT. All right, talk about it. Oh my god. At the end of the movie. He says he is he's in the future and he comes back and he says 
Um, he says love, and then he pauses, and music, and then he pauses, and he's like our our eternal or something like that. And it's like you were so close, you could have just said it. You could have just said it. <laughs> Only love and music are forever. You know what? Love never dies is like was the tagline for Bram Stoker's Dracula movie. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that was literally the, the... So every time I see that poster, I'm like, oh, that's where Weber got it. Wouldn't it have been incredible, though, if there was a phantom property that said Love Never Dies in it before fucking Love Never Dies came out? Yeah. We didn't talk a ton about the Phantom's one-liners. <laughs> uh, they're not very good. <laughs> You're suspended. And then he suspends him on a rope. Yeah, and then stabs him. Yeah, and then... <laughs> <laughs> is this what you wanted? Slaps across the face with the money. Yeah. It's um his one letters are not very good. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs>